Number 28. A ball with an initial velocity of 8 meters per second rolls up a hill without slipping. Treating the ball as a spherical shell, calculate the vertical height it reaches. All right, so here's a little picture. We have this uh, ball, which is a thin spherical shell, um, rotating, right? Because it says it's going to roll up a hill without slipping. So the ball or the shell is going to be rotating on up the hill. So we know that there's a couple of things going on here that the uh, ball itself has rotational kinetic energy because it is rolling and it also has translational energy, okay, or kinetic energy of motion. And then we are tasked to find the height that it can finally reach, okay? So this sounds like, generally speaking, when you're not given a lot of information, right? I mean, they just told us that it's initial velocity of 8 meters per second, and now we got to find the, the height. Generally, you're going to be looking at this from an energy perspective, okay? So what that means is that uh, conservation of energy is at play. So the energy that is inherent in the system initially will equal the energy that is inherent in the system finally, okay? So we have three types of energies in the problem, right? We have translational or uh, kinetic energy of motion, okay, because they told us that the ball is moving at 8 meters per second. Meters per second is a linear, um, uh, what's the word, a linear variable, okay. So I know that there's translational motion here. I also know that they told us that the ball is rolling up a hill, all right, um, since it's rolling up the hill without slipping, it is rotating, and therefore I also know, according to this formula over here on the right-hand side, that the ball should also have some rotational kinetic energy. And we know that we're talking about height, so we're also dealing with potential. Uh, po yes, potential. <laughs> That's a mix between potential and gravitational. Potential. Um, potential energy due to gravity, all right? Or gravitational potential energy. All right, still a little early over here. So uh, let's detail all of those energies. So we have the um, what do we got? So we have the kinetic energy of rotation initially, plus the kinetic energy of motion, which is the translational value initially, plus the potential energy due to gravity initially, will equal all of these final values. The kinetic energy of rotation finally, plus the kinetic energy of motion finally, plus the potential energy of gravity finally. Now, what is, so let, let's see if we can start canceling some easy items. At the beginning of this stage, when the ball is at the bottom of the hill, is there any gravitational potential? No, right? Because we're assuming it's starting at the bottom and there's no height to it. So that means that this term goes bye-bye. It also is asking us, we want to calculate the vertical height that the ball will reach. So we are assuming that there will be no translational or no rotational energy inherent at the top, right? A, a key word that we could have substituted in here would calculate the maximum vertical height, okay? It doesn't say maximum, but I mean, I have to assume that. Otherwise, at what, at what point do we, uh, do we cut the problem off? It's totally subjective then. So uh, really, we're asking to find the maximum uh, vertical height. And that being the case, I know then all the rotational kinetic energy and all of the energy that was inherent uh, due to translational energy is going to also go bye-bye. So what that means now is we have a simplified formula that the uh, kinetic energy of rotation initially plus the kinetic energy of motion initially must equal the potential energy of uh, due to gravity finally. Now, Let's expand on each of these values. We know their formulas, okay? The rotational kinetic energy is one half multiplied by the moment of inertia multiplied by the angular velocity squared. And that's initial because it's the initial condition. Plus then the kinetic energy of motion, which is one half multiplied by the mass of the object that is moving, uh, then multiplied by the velocity initially squared, okay? That will then equal the mass of the object multiplied by gravity, then multiplied by the final height. Okay, so this is what we're after. If this is what we're after, we better know all of the other variables in the problem. Okay, what's nice though about this is the fact that we have mass in each term, right? And I'm sure you're familiar with seeing these problems and doing a lot of practice. 
Um, well, actually, we do have mass. I'm jumping ahead, though, right? I, I know that there's mass in here. So let me do this one thing first. Let me then substitute in this equation for the thin spherical shell, which is found on page 359, all right, of the OpenStax textbook. Um, we can then substitute this on in that formula. Okay, that turned out to be a weird line. And what I now will have is one half multiplied by the mass of the object that's rotating. Now the, the object that's rotating is the, ma the mass that's rotating is the same as the mass of the whole ball. All right, so I know that all of these m's are the same. Multiplied then by the radius of the ball uh, squared, all divided then by, uh, oops, I almost forgot the two and the three, right? Here, this whole thing is two thirds. I'm gonna write two thirds multiplied by m r squared. Okay, that is multiplied then by the initial angular velocity squared, plus then one half m v i squared is equal to m g h sub f. Okay, now cup right. We know the masses are all the same, and since they're common in each term, right? I could have factored out these masses here, and then factored out a mass here, and we could have canceled them, which I did. All right. So now, why don't we clean it up just a little more, okay? So let's combine some terms here. So this is really now one-third, right? Because that works out to be one-third, uh, multiplied by r squared omega i squared is equal to, I, I said one-third, but it somehow turned out to be one-half. I don't know how that happened. So one-third um, is not equal to. It's going to be then added to one-half vi squared, is equal to g times hf. Okay. Now we're almost there, right? You might, we, we're probably saying to ourselves, wait a minute, I know the initial velocity and I know what gravity is, but what is the rotational, or what is the angular velocity and what is the radius? They didn't tell me that, right? So now what we have to do is we have to now think about, well, how do I get rid of r and w sub i when all I know is the translational velocity. In other words, remember, we've done this on problems before. The translational velocity of a rotating body is the same, is equal to the tangential velocity. Okay, that is an important, important thing to remember. So that being the case, right, I'll write it on up here now. That being the case, we have this particular formula that the tangential velocity will equal r, the radius, multiplied by then omega. Okay, so what's interesting here is if we think about this particular uh, scenario, notice what we have here. We have r squared omega i squared, right? Now this term right here looks identical, well, almost identical to this term, except what? Except each of these terms here are not squared, and in this term they are both squared. Okay, no big deal. Can you turn this into this somehow? Sure we can, right? We can take this right up here at the top. We can take this and square it. Now remember that will then become, this will become r squared omega squared if I kind of distribute the square, okay? But remember, whatever you do to one side of an equation, you better do to the other side. So this will become the tangential velocity squared, okay? So now, let's see what just happened, okay? What I'm now able to do is take this value and substitute it on in for this value right down there, okay? They are equal to one another as we just sh showed up here. So now what we're gonna do, I'm gonna do the work down here on the bottom uh, uh, left. I'll draw a little line. So now this is going to become one-third multiplied by vt squared. Now remember, vt is the same as the tangential uh, velocity, which is then the same as the translational velocity, which is the same as the initial velocity of the problem, okay? So I can, I can change this t to an i if I want it now. It doesn't really matter. Let me write it out, and then I'll do that, okay? Plus one-half vi squared is equal to now g multiplied by hf. Now notice... These two, again, are identical. So we can just write V now if we wanted. I can put this as VI. It doesn't matter. We talked about why they're the same. Okay. So now what we need to do, right, is we uh, need to just 
solve now for HF. And what we could do is we could simplify this a little bit, okay? We can add these two values together since they have the same base here of VI squared, right? We would take the third and add it to a half, find a common denominator of six, right? And then multiply this by two and this by three and then add two and three together. So you're gonna get five over six. Five over six VI squared is equal to GHF. Since I'm running out of space now, just divide both sides by G, okay? So the, what that will look like is, I'm going to just move this up a little bit. So what that will look like, I'm gonna erase the G here and just divide it out on this side, put the G over there. And there you go, okay? Here's your final formula, look at that. A whole complex problem, you know, is able to be simplified down to this beautiful, you know, well, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? Uh, but this beautiful, simple formula. So now, all I have to do is plug in the values. So here we have 5 6 of the initial velocity squared. So it's 5 6 multiplied by 8 squared all over 9.8. And what do we get? Let's see. 5 over 6 multiplied by 8 squared divided by 9.8. And it looks like we get about 5.44. And yeah, three sig figs is good. So 5.44, 5.44, and this is in terms of meters, okay? That is the height the ball will attain, assuming it doesn't slip and it rolls up the hill. So let's see what happens now when we look at letter B. It says, repeat the calculation for the same ball if it slides up the hill without rolling. Now, there's an assumption here. You might say, well, it's sliding, so isn't there some friction going on? And I would agree with you. There is some friction going on, but did they tell us anything about the two articulating surfaces? Did they tell us the nature of the material the ball is made of and the nature of the material the hill is made of? No, they didn't, right? So who knows what they are? I can't just, you know, I can't just make an assumption here. I have no idea what they, what, what it would be. Absolutely no clue. So therefore, we have to assume, even though it doesn't say, we have to then assume the simplest set of assumptions is to say that it's frictionless, okay? So it's going to slide up the hill without rolling, and there is no friction. So that being the case, I know for some of you out there that might not be satisfying. It, it doesn't say that, but that's what we have to assume here. Um, so it slides up the hill without rolling. Now we know again, the energy that's inherent in the system initially will be equal to the energy that's inherent in the system finally. Okay, there are only now two types of energy. The ball is not rotating. It's not going round and round and round and round up the hill. That being the case, there is no omega. If omega is zero, there is no rotation. Look at the formula over here on the right hand side, guys. If omega here is zero, what happens to the kinetic energy rotation? Goes to zero, all right? So I know that there's only basically translational kinetic energy and potential energy due to gravity. That's it. So I can write that out now, the kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy I'm using here is just gonna be linear translational. It's gonna be the one half mv squared. So I'm just gonna write Ke, okay? Kei plus Pei will equal Kef plus Pef. Now there is no, remember, potential energy initially, it's starting at the bottom, so this term goes bye-bye. And we're assuming that all of the energy that's in, all of the kinetic energy, right, that's inherent in the beginning, was converted into potential energy because we're trying to find the maximum vertical height. So therefore, the ball, once it, once it slides up the hill here, the ball, once it gets to this position, has no more velocity to it. And therefore, that term cancels out. So we're left with a very, very simple equation. Now we have the kinetic energy initially will equal the potential energy finally. Okay, expand on this formula. So remember it's one half mv i squared is equal to mghf. Okay, notice the, oops, notice the masses cancel. Bada bing, bada boom. And all we gotta do now is then just solve this for hf so it's gonna be one half VI squared all over G is equal to HF. We'll plug in the values now. I'm gonna do it over here. So this is one half multiplied by eight squared all over gravity, which is 
and that's going to equal the final height. Let's see what we got. So 0.5 times 8 squared divided by 9.8, and we get 3.27 or so, considering the rounding uh, when we use three sig figs. So here it is 3.27, so 3.27 is equal to, and that's in meters, is equal to the final height, okay? Notice the similarities between the two formulas, ladies and gentlemen, right? What's the only difference between this, or I should say, this ending result for where there is no rotation, and this ending result on the bottom left when there is rotation, right? The only difference is in terms of the fraction. This is one half, and this is five sixth, okay? So five sixth is obviously greater than one half. How did the five sixth come about? The five six, remember, came about when we combined the one third and the one half. So essentially what happened is here is the uh, kinetic energy initially of translation. And what we added to it, we added this rotational kinetic energy. Okay, so whatever this thing worked out to be, whatever the one third worked out to be, all right, which basically works, which then this one third came from where? Well, it came from the one half multiplied by the two thirds. Where did the two thirds come from? The two thirds came from our moment of inertia formula. So the only way this problem will change in terms of uh, the body that's rotating will be a result of this moment of inertia, the fraction that is inherent in here, the two thirds. Okay, if you deal with a different object like a di like a disc, or you know you deal with a thin shell, whatever the case is, a hoop, the only way it's going to change is via the fraction. Okay, and that means this fraction will change. And then that means that this fraction will change. And that's it. And you're going to still be left with the same formula. All right. But just a different fraction. Okay. I think that's enough. Guys, thanks for tuning in. All right. Please remember to subscribe. Helps us out tremendously. Hit that like button. Tell your friends. And I'll see you in the next question. Take care.